But queer sexuality was never simply a dimension of privacy. Homophile activists understood its limitations. Privacy laws would not stop police harassment, mass arrests, or the closing of bars. They would not keep a teacher from being fired or a soldier from being dishonorably discharged. Connecticut activist Foster Gunnison observed that, quote, the danger of this phrase in private is that acceptable heterosexual behavior, kissing in public, holding hands in public, even soliciting sex in public, could be classified as public indecency for the, for the homosexual pair. The worry was that privacy rights might boomerang and recreate the closet, sanctioning private sex lives while enforcing silence about homosexuality in public. Nevertheless, sexual privacy was the, rights, was the right most aggressively pursued um, by the white male leadership of the homophile movement. One of those leaders, Frank Kameny, uh, who was one of the chief architects of the homophile movement before the Stonewall riots in 1969, defined the movement around the concept of the homosexual citizen. This rights-bearing homosexual citizen imagined and called into being in the mid-60s was both white and male. Lesbian activists and the Daughters of Belitis helped found the movement, but discovered their voices and issues crowded out by the overwhelmingly male leadership. The male-led gay rights movement presumed that police harassment, unequal law enforcement, and military service were naturally the most salient gay issues. But as Shirley Willard, president of the Daughters of Belitis, observed in an important essay in 1966, quote, few women are subject to police harassment. Lesbians were not simply gay, but were women, and subject to a range and forces uh, a range of forces and disadvantages that few men uh, ever encountered. The problems of importance to the lesbian, continued Willer, are job security, career advancement, and family relationships. Lesbians, as women, rarely earned the family wage to which, to which men were entitled, supposedly entitled, doubling their vulnerability in the job market. Moreover, many lesbians of the 1960s and 70s generation were in straight marriages and risked, being, risked losing their children when they came out. Divorce law, adoption law, and equal employment opportunity were all more central to lesbian politics than was sexual privacy. As women, as mothers, as both, lesbians did not always find themselves reflected in the homosexual citizen conceived by the male-dominated homophile movement. Okay, so ten minutes more. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, and onto race. The notion of visibility so central to the homophile movement was further complicated by the racial presumptions and racism of whites. Visibility was essential to two kinds of coming out in the 1960s. The first, when one came out into a queer world, when one first encountered and began to move through a larger queer community. The second and more politicized occurred when one came out in public, to family, friends, co-workers, and optimally to society as a whole. In both kinds of coming out, there existed a presumed public space into which one moved, the gay public sphere in the first instance and the larger public sphere of community and nation in the second. Race shaped these versions of visibility in at least three ways. First, the public sphere in the United States has always denied equal access to members of non-white groups. For African Americans and other people of color, there was no neutral public space. They carried race with them in ways whites uh, did not have to. Second, the homosexual citizen presumed that gay men were subject to harassment and discrimination solely because of their sexuality. This was an impossible assumption for people of color who could never presume that race was not at work in their treatment by state authorities. And third, queer people of color have typically engaged the politics of sexuality within and not against indigenous community consciousness, including black power, uh, community, community self-determination, and so on. Forged in the largely middle-class world of white gay professionals, the homosexual citizen and its sexual privacy was remarkably new and important, uh, but it was also incomplete and foreclosed. Now I want to turn briefly to the conservative uh, reaction and the, conservative, the building of the conservative argument about uh, the private. Ideologically capacious, um, the conservative resurgence of the 60s and 70s had appeal across the class spectrum. It gained particular coherence uh, around a whole set of issues, but I'm going to focus on sex roles, sexual differences, and the family in the 1960s and 1970s. Its defenders, both secular and religious, praised the nuclear family as the foundational unit of society, resisted women's rights in the name of preserving sex role differences, 
and linked femininity with motherhood and domesticity and manliness with patriotism and breadwinning. Congressman John Smith, a Republican from Orange County in California, stood before his House colleagues in September of 1971 to oppose the Comprehensive Child Development Act, a bill to provide near-universal child care to American families. A free people today, Smith warned legislators, must be constantly on the guard against such unwarranted intrusions by the government into the life of the family. Comparing a national child care program to totalitarianism, Schmitz Schmitt predicted destruction of the basic family unit if the bill passed. Still others worried that it would, quote, take the responsibility of parents to raise children and give it to the government. To Schmitz and his colleagues, liberalism had taken a radical turn and substituted the state for the domestic authority of parents. The bill passed, and Nixon vetoed it, um, and he vetoed it using the term privacy and the private sphere of the family.